Anyone else? No? But the Nathan wants you come. And looking forward to seeing what the Lord's been doing over these last few years and take the rest of the time till about a quarter. It's good to be with you again this evening. Thanks for coming back. And uh, thank you, Pastor Howell and Mrs. Howell, for the great meal out at Pizza Ranch. My kids enjoyed seeing the farm animals and uh, playing in the house. Lots of good toys and books for kids. <laughs> and dogs. <laughs> we uh, are living with my parents on a farm, so they felt right at home. Um, we've got some prayer cards on the table back there, so if you could just grab one of those. And uh, we do send out periodically updates with requests on how to pray for us, so if you'd like to get those, you can shoot me an email. I'd be glad to add you to my list. And... Uh, at this time, we're just going to show a little video that tells a little more about us and our ministry. The Republic of South Africa is a country on the tip of Africa that borders both the Indian and the Atlantic Ocean. It's a country of great need, yet great wealth. South Africa has beautiful landscape. One of the most beautiful places in the world has oceans, deserts, mountains, rainforests. There's anywhere from remote villages to metropolises. South Africa has a lot of needs. Uh, there's a large unemployment problem that is a symptom of a greater problem, which, which is, is broken, broken homes, uh, lawlessness, and we believe the real answer to the problem is a spiritual answer, and that's the salvation of souls. In 2014, we arrived in South Africa. It was my wife, Laura, and I, and our son, Peter, and Seth, and we joined the Obermiller family to assist them in the ministry at Elon's Fontaine Baptist Church and Bible Baptist Church. Uh, we're able to see Elon's Fontaine Baptist Church become independent, and they're continuing to this day in Elon's Fontaine. We continued to work with Bible Baptist Church of Kempton Park since 2017. The city of Kempton Park is a part of the greater Johannesburg area. When we first arrived in 2014, there was about one member of the church, and we've grown. We have about 25 to 30 people that attend, and was a blessing. The Sunday I left, we got to see one lady baptized and added to the church. One of the great needs in South Africa is a spiritual awakening and salvation. There's a much religiosity. 80% of the people claim Christianity, but most of those people still worship their ancestors and really demonic powers. So salvation is the greatest need in South Africa and revival amongst those who are saved. Well, the burden of the church there is to see the church influence Kempton Park with the gospel. The fatherless rate amongst the population is between 62 to 65 percent. Amongst, amongst the segment of the population we're working with, seven out of ten children don't have a father in the home, and there's a great problem with broken families, drunkenness, drug abuse, and the list goes on and on. We've already seen individual lives changed through the gospel, through discipleship, one-on-one -on -one discipleship, and um, 
because of that, children have been saved, lives have been changed. Laura's main responsibility, of course, is with our children, and uh, she's doing a great job with that. But uh, she also helps out with the church in Sunday school. Um, Laura does help with the music ministry in the church and playing piano on Sundays. She's also working with another young lady to help take over that ministry. My burden for South Africa is to see Bible Baptist Church be an indigenous church and that it would continue until the Lord returns. And to see that the national people there, that the Lord developed in them a heart and a burden for their own people so that things will continue and be strong even in our absence. South Africa is a lot like America in that it's a lot of immigrants travel to South Africa from other African countries because of the wealth that is there. Even though they have a high unemployment rate, it's much better than the surrounding countries. So the advantage in South Africa is that there's Africans from all over Africa who could then go back to their countries, be it Congo, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Kenya, Nigeria, and take the gospel back with them. Our plan when we go back to South Africa is to work with Bible Baptist Church to see the people take leadership in the church. We have people we're already training in music, in preaching, in teaching, and so we're going to continue with that. I think that one of the greatest needs in Christianity in America today is that Americans are comfortable. And it's hard to leave America to go to the mission field. So I'd like people to pray and seek God's will regarding the mission field, regarding surrendering of their lives to the Lord. I think people need to consider, is my life fully surrendered to whatever God would have me to do? Well, the need is great in South Africa. Not everybody can go there. So the greatest thing that can be done is, first of all, to pray, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers and then be willing if he calls you to go. And if God doesn't call you to go, to give to those who do go, to enable them to go. So uh, we just recently bought our tickets, so we're going to... Lord willing, head back to South Africa on the 2nd of August. So between now and then, we have a very busy schedule. So just pray for us in the next coming months that as we go around, one of our biggest duties is to challenge people with the need. There's a great need in the world today. We've got an opportunity to reach the world with the gospel. And uh, the world isn't just uh, somewhere far away, it's somewhere right next door. I like uh, at some churches, sometimes they have a, over the exit door to the auditorium, you are now entering the mission field. Remember that when you walk out of those doors this, night, this evening, you are now entering your mission field. Uh, we uh, are currently working with, as was mentioned on the video, Bible Baptist Church, which is just a couple minutes drive from uh, the main airport in Africa, uh, OR Tambo International Airport. It's a hub for Southern Africa, uh, at least. And um, 
I, w I shouldn't say for all of Africa, but definitely Southern Africa, the biggest airport in South Africa, and Johannesburg, Pretoria area has 10 to 12 million people. So the opportunities are endless. Um, we, how did we get there? Well, my wife's father was a missionary there. I did an internship with him for Bible college, got to know his daughter. We got married, and we started working with them. And this church uh, called Bible Baptist that we had done some stuff with um, was about to close down. They had one member left, and they wanted to sell the property and donate it to other ministries. And um, the Lord enabled that not to go through and for the church to continue on. And so in 2017, we took over full-time guiding that ministry. And uh, when we left on furlough, we didn't have a pastor yet for the church. So we looked around for a replacement, but uh, the Lord didn't give us a furlough replacement missionary, but we did uh, eventually, about a month after we got back, we were able to get a pastor from the area to start preaching for us every three Sundays. I think I mentioned that this morning. And then another pastor that we know preaches one of the other Sundays, and they're really doing a good job. I was able to go back for a week in, uh, I think it was January. Everything's kind of a blur for me. I'm doing so many things. Uh, but went back for a week and uh, was glad to see what the Lord is doing. There's a man named Mesmer that before my last brief furlough in uh, 2017, I think it was, we came back for just a few months and left back in just, I think it was November to January or something like that. And um, after that, um, where was I going with that? Um, after, I, can't, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, so anyways, 2017, 2018, we went on a brief furlough. And then uh, during that time, we've, I can't know, I don't know where I was going. I'm getting old, sorry. Too many things on my mind. Anyways, uh, in that, oh, I know, Mesmer. So Mesmer uh, came up to me before I left on my furlough, and uh, we talked a little bit. I never met him before. And then when I get back, he started coming to church. And he wasn't going to church after I left. I'm not sure why. But then he started coming to church. He was saved. And uh, he's been really a faithful man in the church. And um, while I've been gone, he's kind of, he's not the pastor, but he's kind of taken the leadership of a pastor, um, even though there's other men preaching in the church. And so Mesmer's really been helping with that. So when I communicate with the church, I go through him, and uh, he helps to you know, make daily decisions possible without being right there. So it's really a blessing to see that. And um, one of the things that I see going forward is uh, trying to train the people that we do have to start taking responsibility for the church. So the church has a property. If you remember seeing the church building there, that's owned by the church. And um, we were blessed to have that when we began with the church. We basically restarted the church from scratch. None of the original people are there, but the Lord has brought everybody that is there. And uh, we've got a young man named Sia that uh, was reached through a youth outreach that we've, been, we've done over the years. And now he's leading the songs and does some of the preaching um, on Wednesdays and Saturdays uh, for our prayer meetings. And uh, he was pictured on our video leading singing. You might have Remember seeing that? That was Sia. So pray for Sia. Pray for Mesmer. There's another guy named Linda. When I went back in January for a week, he had recently started bringing his brother, Siba Siso. Siba Siso means blessing and uh, has been a blessing having Siba Siso coming. Pray for Siba Siso to be saved. And um, so we're looking to see God do a work in these people and for them to take leadership and ownership for their church. One of the things that we've noticed is a struggle in Africa, and you can imagine, is to get Africans to be willing to pay a pastor. Um, you know, it's easy for Americans to send 
10 bucks uh, or 100 bucks and support an African pastor, but that's really not long term a, a sustainable way to build churches in Africa. We want to see them become independent and for the people there to tithe. And so just pray that the people would learn to do that, be willing to support their pastor. And we've got a couple opportunities, at least one big one that right now we've got a lady that has a daycare that's renting part of our property that's helping to bring in income. And then hopefully next year we can start our own daycare and use that as an av avenue for people in the church to have something to do and also reach out to people and see more people added to the church. So we're thankful for what God is doing, will do. And um, if you remember on our video, we had a picture of a family, a mom, dad, and three kids. Um, and those are people that are from Malawi that came down to South Africa to work. And they're going to be going back to Malawi probably in September of this year. Um, and when I was back there in January, uh, it was mentioned to me that they love to have us plant a church in Malawi. So pray that the Lord would give us wisdom in how to do something like that. It's a, a, a lot to do, but we know he is able. So we need co-laborers. We need uh, people to respond to the call. And we also want to respond to the call of God is calling us to. So pray for that. So that's the quick version. Um, oh, I meant, want to mention one more thing. A few years ago, my wife got a WhatsApp message. You ever heard of WhatsApp? It's kind of like Facebook, but it's owned by Facebook. It's just a messaging service. And it was from a lady in our church. She said, uh, Mrs. Roberts, uh, could you please give me a ride to the hospital or something like that? I really need help. And she has, well, she had six kids. One of them was adopted. She's a single mom. And one of so that child that was adopted was in boarding school. Another was in a squatter's camp, and the other four were living with her in a single room. And we were like, we know she can't go to the hospital because she's got four kids. What are, what's she going to do with the kids? So what's going to happen is she'll go to the hospital, they'll give her pills and send her home, and then she's just going to be getting sick again. And so we're like, well, let's take the four kids and watch them for the night or until she gets better. So we told that to her. She's like, yeah, that's a... That'll, I, uh, I'm really making it sound nice. Uh, she was, you know, on the edge of her bed like this. Yes. And so we just got a bunch of clothes and a garbage bag, took them all into the car and took her to the hospital, dropped her off. The last I saw her, she was hunched over in a wheelchair with an oxygen tube in her nose. And um, that was the last time I saw her alive. Next morning, I took kids to school, went to talk to their older brother, and said, your mom's in the hospital. And he was shocked. Then I went to talk to the principal, said their mom is in the hospital. And she's like, no, we got a call from the hospital. She died during the night. So I was like, well, what do we do now? Now these five kids don't have a mother, and their fathers are nowhere to be seen. One of their fathers was dead, and four different fathers, as far as we know. So we took them into our home, and for the last three years, we've taken care of them. And uh, shortly before we left, the two older children, uh, we found a place for them to stay. And the three younger, um, their names are Kanya, Mbali, and Jojo. They are on their way to, into a Ontatile Ministries, which is like a orphanage type of a ministry for kids. And so they're... Uh, really doing well there. We're thankful for how God allowed us to have a small part in rescuing them from the cycle of uh, fatherlessness, abuse, and all sorts of stuff we can't go into tonight. But we're thankful for the small part we had in that. You, some might wonder, where are our African children? That's where they are. So any questions? Anybody? 
Yes, sir. Most of the people speak English outside of the home, so it's like a second language. There's 11 official languages in South Africa, but English is the language kind of like in America. Everybody speaks English basically. I mean, it's on the road signs. Obviously, there's people who speak Spanish and stuff, but you know, in order to get a job and stuff, most people need to learn English there. Um, Zulu is pretty well widely spoken. I speak more Chichewa than any other language there, uh, which is a language from Malawi because we've got a lot of Malawians in our neighborhood. So I speak a Ndi uh, Kuluma Chichewa. <laughs> pangono, Pangono. I speak Chichewa a little bit. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have some friends in South Africa, but uh, Johannesburg, and they were telling that on a daily basis, children are put to garb to garbage, and uh, babies, yeah. newly born babies, the, some sometimes they find three or more than that a day. That's in the in the in the. Yeah, it wouldn't garbage. surprise me if that's true. It does happen. Uh, unfortunately, that happens in America too, but um, I, it doesn't surprise me at all. Like the case that we dealt with on a personal level, this lady was saved that we took in the kids. She got saved, but before she was saved, she was basically you know, living that life. Um, and uh, in fact, I've got a picture, I think on my phone uh, in Kempton Park when we were doing door-to-door -door visitation there's a little door that you open on somebody. They, most of the houses have either a wall or a fence, and this one had a wall, and they had a door in the wall where you put a little baby, and it's got a buzzer on the door when you open it for them to know that you put the baby in there, and then they'll rescue the baby. So, yeah. Seven out of ten kids don't have a father in the home, and that's... Actually, I was talking to one African man. He's like, actually, no, I think it's more like 9 out of 10. You can pass the 30% in school. So I heard recently, and I think this is a pretty well uh, you know, verified statistic, that 18 to 35-year-olds have a 75% unemployment rate. And the commentator was saying, this is a ticking time bomb. Last year, uh, the former president who is, should have been in jail 20 years ago, was put in jail. And he only ended up being there for a little while because of corruption. But when he was put in jail, a lot of crazy looting happened. You thought the BLM riots were bad here? That wasn't anything. There were whole shopping malls that were completely cleared out. Hundreds of people swarming the, the malls destroying property. During COVID, the rail lines from Johannesburg to Pretoria, people stole the overhead wires. So now the trains can't even run. Uh, so we're talking a country that has a lot of serious needs. Um, and so it's a lot of missionaries are leaving the country. Um, I was really trying to help some people on a... Uh, because of this fatherless problem, the kids don't know how to work. They, don't, they can't get jobs because they don't know how to work and they get a 30% school and they flunk and even if they pass, they really did flunk. You know what I mean? Uh, so they don't know how to do much. And so I was trying to teach them farming and it got to the point where I was like, wanting well, to pull out my hair. And I was my go-to verse, it just kept going over and over in my head when Jesus talked about the, the man who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes you feel like quitting. And I know missionaries have quit. Some have left for good reasons, but others have quit because it's difficult. And uh, we thank God for giving us perseverance, endurance, and we thank, we're thankful for the fruit 
that we've seen. Uh, but there's a lot of difficulties. And you're not going to get that in most prayer letters because missionaries can't tell you about all the bad stuff because we want to tell you about the blessings because God is good. But there are definitely difficulties and hardships. So, yes, ma'am. How receptive are the people in general to hearing the gospel? Uh, I'll give you an illustration. Uh, in Kempton Park, I was going soul winning with a man, and we went to a house, and this house was like a three-bedroom house, I think, two- or three-bedroom house, and each different room, living room, will be a, a family, bedroom one, family, bedroom two, family, uh, dining room, a family, and then they all share the main hallway and kitchen and bathroom. And so we got to spend like an hour in that house just talking to the people there because people are receptive. So, yes, people are generally receptive. Thankfully, there's still somewhat, somewhat of a fear of God in South Africa and receptivity to spiritual things. Although most people, as I said on my video, most people who claim to be Christian really aren't because they still worship their ancestors. So we desire to give them the real, true gospel, that Jesus is the only way to God. Okay, let's take our Bibles, turn to Isaiah. If you have any other questions, I'll be glad to answer them afterwards. As they say in South Africa, Isaiah, turn to Isaiah. Chapter 1, verse 5. I think I might have left my outline down there. Okay, it's not there. Okay, turn to Isaiah. Oh, here it is. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5. And I want to read a few verses here. And this is just a, a background. And I want to kind of see that the time that we're living in today in America and in the world in general is much like the time in which Isaiah was living. Isaiah 1 verse 5, why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Then I want us to look at Isaiah six. And here's when Isaiah was given the privilege of seeing, of having a vision of the throne room of God and there he saw the seraphim crying one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And his response here in verse 5 is what I want to look at. He said, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
Then said I, here am I, send me. I want us to see that today God is still calling people. And God can still do a great work in this time. You know, we, we could uh, easily get into our mind a wrong view of the world, knowing the truth of Scripture, but getting a pessimistic outlook on life and on God and on the world. Now, when Isaiah said, woe is me, he didn't mean like, woe is me, there's nothing that can be done. Woe is me because God is holy. And I am undone. So what happened was there was a cleansing that took place. And when the cleansing took place, Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah responded, Here am I. Send me. Now I want us to take our Bibles again. Turn to 1 Samuel. And I want us to look at another person who heard the voice of the Lord and said, here am I. And this is what needs to happen in our time. People need to hear the voice of the Lord and say, here am I. There's a problem today that many Institutions who were formerly used greatly to see many missionaries and pastors start churches and reach mission fields are no longer sending people out. If you look at the, the numbers, it's just not happening like it used to. Is it because God's voice isn't calling, here, uh, calling us here anymore in America? Or perhaps it's because we're unwilling to say, here am I. I want us to see, first of all, a time, a time of spiritual barrenness. First Samuel 3, verse 1, it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. The word of the Lord was precious. There wasn't much of it going on. You know, through a, if, if you get, you read the Bible through, which is good to do, uh, sometimes you can get this idea that there was miracles happening all the time because, wow, there's just amazing things that are happening in the Bible. The, the Red Sea's uh, parting, the, the Jordan River is parting, uh, a leper is being cleansed, but it wasn't happening every day. Most of the time, just like it is now, God had people he was dealing with that had truth and had to respond to truth. And it wasn't like miracles were happening every second. There was a man named Eli that God was supposed to be working through, but that man wasn't a willing vessel. And because he wasn't a willing vessel and he wasn't willing to uh, clean up shop, so to speak, wasn't willing to deal with his family like he should have, wasn't willing to offend somebody that could have been offended, wasn't willing to step on toes. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. But God wanted to talk to his people. That's how God communicated with his people in those days. But he needed a man who was willing to stand in the gap. And though we have the whole scripture... We have all the way from Genesis to Revelation. God still wants men who will stand in the gap. God still wants men and women and individuals who will make a difference in the world today. We could go on and on and on about the needs in the world today and the needs in Madison, Wisconsin, the needs in Wisconsin and Milwaukee and Chicago and the United States and Mexico and Ukraine and Russia 
And there's great things happening here and there, but greater things could be happening. There's a, an island out in the Indian Ocean that has anywhere from two to 400 people who have never had substantial contact with the outside world. They don't have a written language. Nobody knows their language. Therefore, they've never received the gospel. And they need to hear about Jesus. That's the island of North Sentinel. Maybe you should start praying about it. I'm sure God would like to send somebody there. But someone's got to get a burden. Someone's got to start praying the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. That those people on North Sentinel will hear the word of the Lord. Today we live in a time of spiritual barrenness. Even though most people have access to more of the Bible and more preaching and more good Christian music and more Bible teaching than ever before. Yet, there's still a time of spiritual barrenness because God's people aren't responding to God's voice like they should. But there was a man who was willing to obey. And we're going to look at him. And he was just a boy. Came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. Notice what happens next. And he what? Can we all say that word together? And he ran. How many times does God have to call us before we respond? I know in my life, God had to call many times before I finally got the message, Nathan, you need to be a missionary to Africa. How many times has God been working on your heart, friend? You need to be a pastor. You need to be a deacon. You need to win that soul to Jesus Christ that before we respond, not only did Samuel say, here am I, but he ran. Now, if you're a child tonight, that's what you ought to do when your parents call you. You should say yes, and you should run to your parents to find out what they'd like from you. It was a willing servant, an obedient servant. He said, here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. And you can imagine Samuel thinking, wow, Eli really must be getting old. He's forgetting really quickly here. He's calling me, but I'll go anyways. I'm going to obey my authority. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to obey. I'm going to honor. And even though Eli wasn't his father and Eli was actually a bad father, even though he wasn't his father, a bad example, yet he still understood that this was God's ordained authority in his life. And so he went and he ran and said, here am I, even though it was the middle of the night when most people won't obey. Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. There, therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he shall call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now I want to see, not only was Samuel a willing servant, he was an obedient servant. He, didn't just, he wasn't just willing to obey. It wasn't just like, you know, when I was 12 years old, I got down on my knees and I, I uh, surrendered my life to the Lord. Have you, any of you ever done that? You said, Lord, anything you want from my life, missionary, pastor, soul winner, whatever it might be, I'll do it, Lord. But then when God says, hey, I want you to be a pastor, 
why don't you go start a church in that little town over there of 250 people, whatever, you know, it might be Lafarge, Wisconsin, or something like that. And you say, oh, now that's not so easy. You see what I mean? The difference between willingness to obey, kind of like the story that the Lord told about the two sons. The one son said, I'm not going to do that. The second uh, son said, I'm, I'm going to do it. He didn't do it. But the first son changed his mind and went and did what the fa father said. There should be a third category of people who say, yes, I will obey, Lord, and immediately they get up and obey, just like Samuel. So what happened? Verse 10, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Now, in the time that we live today, the message of the Bible is not going to be a popular message. There's coming a time, perhaps, when you'll get put in jail for preaching the truth. Over in South Africa, when the COVID thing started happening, it became illegal to have church. So I had to make a choice. What are we going to do? So we got creative, but we still had church. And I remember looking out the windows wondering if I was going to get arrested. There has to come a point when you obey no matter what the cost and give the message people need to hear no matter what the cost. That's the duty of pastors and teachers and parents today is to be willing to say the truth, even though it's unpopular. Notice it was an unpopular message. It says, both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. This is going to be a pretty disturbing message. Jeremiah had a message that was pretty disturbing. They threw him in the dungeon. He was about to die in that dungeon for the message that he preached. And many martyrs in the Bible in fact, Jesus Christ died because of the truth that he spoke and for our sins. We've got to be willing to die to obey the Lord. Are you willing to die for the Lord? Now, some of us, have you ever had that little thought in your mind, if persecution came to America, would I be willing to die for the Lord? Would I be willing to go to jail for my faith? Have you ever thought that? I've thought that. Well, maybe we should start asking ourselves these questions like, well, am I reading my Bible? Am I praying? Am I going out soul winning now? Am I faithful to church now? And am I involved in the ministry now? Because if you're not now, when the persecution and the real tests come, probably then you won't be. So an obedient servant and I also want to see that he was a truthful servant. God tells uh, Samuel what he's going to do to judge Eli. It was a pretty bad message, pretty, 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 uh, um, uh, really a message that would affect Eli, could make him angry. So he was afraid to tell Eli the message. Verse 15, and Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here am I. And he said, what is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee. And more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. What an encouraging father figure. God bring the curse on you that he would put on me if you don't tell me everything that he told you. Verse 18, and Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. So we see a, a willing servant, an obedient servant, and a truthful servant. He was willing to tell the truth. People need to hear the truth. They need to hear that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They need to hear that their sins are sin. God's word doesn't change. What was sin yesterday is sin today. What was sin 50 years ago is a sin today. I know people's opinions are changing 
in Christianity on what is right and what is wrong, but God doesn't change. If it was wrong 100 years ago, it's wrong today. If it was wrong 10 years ago, it's wrong today. Morality in America is changing. I don't know if you've noticed it. Remember who signed the Defense of Marriage Act? Bill Clinton. And now most Republicans are afraid to talk about what true marriage is. We, we won't even get into what's happening in Christianity today, but people need servants of God who will tell them the truth unashamedly. And if they will, let's look at what will happen. They will be fruitful. Verse 19, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. Remember verse 1 of the chapter? The word of the Lord was precious in those day, there, days. There was no open vision. It says here, the word, the Lord appeared again. God can appear again in America. We haven't had revival in America for over 150 years. Real revival, nationwide revival. We need that again. It can happen, but it has to start right here at the house of God. And write individually in your own life and in your own heart and in my heart. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Revival, awakening, great moves of God can still happen today. We don't know when Jesus is going to return. We do know that when he returns, the tribulation will begin. But until then, he doesn't tell us. What's going to happen? In other words, you have every opportunity to see God do a great work today, just like it has happened in the last 2,000 years. The Roman Empire wasn't any better than America. It was just as wicked and dirty. And the world was turned upside down, as they said in Philippi by those original believers. So let's uh, look to God and be willing. He calls us to go. Perhaps some of you guys are younger. Children, young people, college students. We don't desperately need more Christian plumbers. We don't desperately need more Christian architects. Architects. We don't need, desperately need more Christian accountants. We, we would like to see them, right? Yes. But what we desperately need today is more churches. We desperately need them in Wisconsin. We desperately need them in America. We desperately need more missionaries so that we can fulfill the word of God and the Great Commission. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Great Commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Lord, as a church that is supporting missionaries, I know Grace Baptist Church is seeking to fulfill that. Lord, perhaps someone here tonight, you are calling into full-time Christian service as a missionary or a church planter. Lord, we desperately need to see you work, but we know that you require your people to respond. So we ask that that would happen tonight in each one of our hearts, that we would be willing 